February 5th, 1951, at John Gaston Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, John and Pearl DeBerry had a young, uh, had a boy, excuse me. They named him John Jr. That's, that's me. And my dad was a Korean War veteran, fresh. Mother and my mother and my dad was converted a few years when they were before when they were courting and I was blessed to be in a Christian home I was blessed to have a father and a mother who always kept me focused as to what was important in the midst of the days of racial discord as we would call it back then but I, I don't see it even as much discord as we see today but back in the days of separate but equal and segregation, uh, I was raised in a Christian home where it was basically irrelevant, where a lot of the things that were going on in the country did not affect us the way that they were affecting a lot of people because my dad always reminded me that my country uh, and my king and my lord and my leader was the Lord. I was always reminded that I was a member of his kingdom and that the Lord is the king. It's not a democracy and I don't have a vote and the Lord is in charge. Well, once you get that in your head and you understand that, it puts everything else in perspective. The problem with too many of us is that everything that happens on this earth is more important than those things that have been settled and sent to us from heaven. The Bible lets me know and lets every one of us know in the golden text of the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. The Lord didn't come to embarrass us, to beat us down, to show us how stupid we were, how ignorant we were, or that we can't run the earth, our family, our lives. The Lord didn't come to walk around with his nose up in the air, showing us our faults, fears, fallacies, fantasies, and failures. The Lord came to strengthen our faith. He came to give us an example. And what the Lord taught me was... From the way he was brought up, from being born in a stable, basically a place where the animals were kept, and I don't care how many times Hollywood shows us this hygienic, pure, with the little lambs standing there in the prayer mode, and the little cows bowing, and all that. That, that was a barn. There are feces. He is wrapped in swaddling clothing and swaddling cloth and laid on a feeding trough, which is what a manger was, where you put the food for the animals to eat and lick and saliva and whatever in that feeding trough. What God did was bring Jesus into the world in the most humble of fashions to take away all my excuses. All of my excuses about being white, about being black, red, yellow, polka dot, a pinstripe. All my excuses about being Republican, Democrat, green, tree hugger, whatever you want to be. All of my excuses about being north, south, east, west, rich, poor, educated, illiterate, ignorant. Jesus came to tear down all that stuff. Tear it all down. And then make you look at yourself and place yourself in a position that you can be the most positive influence and, and, and change agent in a world that he sent us to change. Now, God has been good to us in America. And you know, when I was born, as I said, in 51, the world was a different place than it is today. But I will say, uh, I had a wonderful upbringing in wonderful schools and wonderful churches with wonderful parents. And I'm not so sure that there are some things today that aren't as good as they were even back then. The fact of the matter is, we had a totally different perspective Everybody had the perspective of making the country better. We had come out of World War II. We had gone into the Korean War. Many of you, uh, many of our fathers and grandfathers and great-grandfathers had fought in those wars. They came home with a totally different perspective, having saved the world, having seen piles of dead bodies, having watched their comrades burn to death or decapitated or fall out of the sky in airplanes with 30 and 40 men killed at one 
time. They had watched all of this happen, and America meant something to them. It meant something to them. My dad prominently hung his army uniform, and I remember looking at that uniform and admiring it as a child. He drove a tank, and he eventually learned was what, that when the Air Force and the Army uh, 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 split, he, he wanted to learn how to fly helicopters, and I saw him in his gear and his goggles, and, it, and I remember standing there with pride, looking at that uniform and listening to him talk about what it meant to be a soldier and why he was a soldier and why he had fought and why uh, that I and others should commit ourselves to the country. I didn't hear a whole bunch of goobity gop about uh, how bad the country was and how terrible it was to be colored and all this stuff like this. I didn't hear all that stuff. What I heard was as a Christian, Nick, as he called me, Nick, this is how you make it better. We've gotten away from that. We have set and forgotten that everybody else in the world wants what we got. That every potentate, every little two for a nickel dictator on the planet wants what we got. That everywhere where folks are suffering and dying of hunger and malnutrition when there's plenty of food, when men are using food and water as weapons to starve their own people, Everybody wants what we got. When our children would get up tomorrow morning and go to school for a free education or an education that you have provided, everybody wants what you got. When our women will get in the cars and drive and have their homes and live their life raising their children and respecting their men and loving the Lord in their church, everybody wants what we got. And when we forget that, when we forget that, we become weak and we lose sight of what God wants from us. When Solomon wrote to the people in the book of Proverbs chapter 14 and verses 34, as every one of you in this room can quote, and I know you can, I know you can quote it. Solomon said, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a shame, a reproach to any people. What the devil wants to do is get us so engrossed in sin, and sin is transgression of God's law. This nation that was built in all of its faults and failures. Of, of course there are things that we wish we hadn't done. There are laws we wish we hadn't made. There are activities that we wish hadn't gone on in our borders. But where is the perfect nation? So tell me what it is. Show me the nation that has none of the same mistakes and failures and faults and, and if not worse than our young 200 and something year old nation have. There are nations with 2,000 year old buildings. We're only a couple hundred years old. But we have something different from everybody else. We have something called a constitution. And a constitution that we have amended over and over and over, we turn to a higher. The constitution is the greatest document written by man. But you know why it's great? Because it depends upon the greatest document ever written. It was written by God. And as we look at our constitution, while others are changing towards secular humanism and worldly concerns and evolution and atheism and agnosticism, we, on the other hand, slavery was not ended just because somebody had an epiphany and said that's not right. Slavery ended because somebody quoted the scriptures that God created all men equal. Oh, really? then now there is a conflict. There is a conflict, and our nation becomes better because we, unlike everybody else, turn to the scriptures. Women got the vote because someone turns to the scripture and see what God created in the woman. We change our laws because God's law dictates the way we think. Solomon said, as I said, righteousness, or David said, righteousness exalts a nation, uh, but sin is a shame or a reproach, Solomon said, to any people. Whenever sin becomes the mainstay and the main thought of a nation, then that nation begins to turn away from God. 
We must keep in mind at all times when we think about this, Jeremiah said one time when he looked at God's people, he said, were they ashamed? 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 when they committed these abominations. He said, no, they were not ashamed, neither did they blush. Our society is quickly becoming a society that doesn't blush. We can see nudity paraded around in front of us, and folks don't blush, they're used to seeing it. On our television programs, I was watching, just happened to have been sitting at my desk, the news went off, and one of the soap operas came on, and I kind of glanced over to the left there, sitting at my desk, and it was two men laying in the bed together cuddling. I almost threw up on my desk right there. I couldn't grab the remote quick enough to change the channel. You know why? Because folks are watching this during the day as they wash their dishes, as their children are playing in the house. Do they blush? Is there shame? No. He said they don't blush. American society is quickly becoming a society that has lost its shame, has lost its ability to blush, has lost its ability to feel indignation, has looked upon those things and caused evil good and good evil, and therefore you, as God's men, are on the wrong side of history. I was told in my last election, while the young lady that ran against me, she was saying that, that we're on the wrong side of history, that stuff is changing, that marriage between same sexes has been upheld by the Supreme Court. While abortion is, liber is already legal and a woman has a right to decide what to do with her own body. On and on and on I heard as they brought the openly gay legislators from around the country to campaign against me. And, and women uh, 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 activists from around the country, they stood on one street and put tape on their mouth on either side of the street and said, Representative D. Barry is taking away your voice. Well, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, what folks want y'all to do is just disappear. My brethren, 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 they want you to disappear because they say there are no men left like you. There are no men with backbone, guts, courage, determination, principles, and character. Just disappear. That's what they want you to do. Just disappear. That there are no men not like Joshua who stood up and looked the children of Israel eyeball to eyeball, like you're going to have to do if you're going to save your community and save your schools, save your families, and save this country. You're going to have to be men like Joshua who says to the children of Israel, look, if you don't mind me paraphrasing, he says, look, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, as he said to those brethren, he said, choose, 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 choose this day, not tomorrow, right now. You choose this day who you're going to serve. Probably too many of our brethren is they haven't chosen sides yet. They're still wavering, straddling the fence, waffling along, trying to decide who, what's in their best interest. Instead of digging in and setting your feet the way you did, many of you, when you were athletes and soldiers and fighters, we've lost our fight because the devil has beat us down to where we think that other folks are in charge. How in the world can you think that when God is your friend, who can be your enemy? And I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, is what the Apostle Paul said. Joshua said, choose. Choose this day. Not tomorrow, right now, who you're going to serve. But then this man did what God needs you as men to do. You say, this belongs to us. And like my daddy used to say, I'm not going another further. I'm stopping right here. God needs his men to say, as Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. So that's not even up for discussion as to how our daughters are going to be raised. It's not up for discussion as how our boys are going to learn how to act like men. It's not even up for discussion that our family is not going to be your modern family accepting all of this foolishness from the outside world. 
to change who we are, what we are, and who we serve. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We are in a nation and in a time where we realize something. As the apostle, as, as John was exiled on the island of Patmos, they had tried to kill him by poisoning him, and they weren't successful. They got frustrated because God, the Lord had already told John he was going to take care of his mama and that he was the only one who was going to die a natural death. So when they couldn't kill him by poisoning them, they, he, they sent him to the island of Patmos, which is a prison colony that's probably one of the most terrible places on earth for him to die. But the Lord had other plans for him before he died. And the Bible lets me know that the Lord God gave to Jesus, Jesus to the angel, the angel to John. John sent by messengers on the imperial postal route to the seven churches of Roman Asia Minor. As the Lord revealed to him the revelation. And within that, those seven churches represent much of what's going on in our country today and what's going on in the church. And we'll talk about that more later. But to the church at Ephesus, he says, you have left your first love. Your first love. And when we look at America today, we realize that we have left our first love. We've left that nation that was started for religious freedom. Now folks are saying there is a separation of church and state. Separation of church and state don't mean a separation of God and country. Separation of church and state means that the Catholic church can't run the country. That's what it meant from the original founders of the country, not that religion was not supposed to have its proper benefit and its proper effect in our lives. We've gone down the moral elevator in this nation. And because of this, it's, it has caused all of the problems. Remember when we prayed at school, before we ate our lunch, we thanked the Lord for our food, we thank you for our food. Remember when we used to teach our children to pray at night, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul will keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to take. Remember how prayer was part of our day. Remember how we sat with our families and talked. Remember how husbands and wives took on the responsibility of understanding they're preparing the next generation? Well, brothers and sisters, religion in America now has become just a big, decadent, materialistic, self-serving, crooked business. And because of this, those who want to fight religion are doing everything they can to bring all of this denominational stuff, the Pope made a declaration yesterday that the Lord's prayer needs to be changed. That lead us not into temptation needs to be taken out of the prayer because that worships a God that tempts us. I'm saying, what an idiot. What an idiot. Doesn't he realize that God is not tempted with evil, neither tempt he every man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust and is enticed. What an idiot that he's going to claim to be the leader of the world, a billion followers, and he doesn't understand the simple prayer that the Lord was teaching the apostles how to pray, that that meant basically help us not fall into our own enticement, our own weakness, but let us hold on to your strength. What America is doing right now is becoming more and more confused. The Bible lets me know very clearly that God is not the author of confusion. That word confusion in that context means instability. The instability that we see in our families, in our schools, in our communities, in our country is not because God has left us. It's because we have left God. We elect men and women who constantly make laws that are shameful and abominable. What type of person would say that it's okay to snatch a child from what ought to be the safest place on earth, his mama's womb, and take that child like human garbage and pull him apart and put him in a black plastic bag and throw him away or sell the body parts. What type of people do stuff like that? 
Right now on television, we're talking about dogs have souls, but babies don't have souls. What kind of people do stuff like that, that will protect the dog and kill the baby? What type of people are these? These are folks who have walked away from the law of God. And these are people who have turned away from the way of God. And therefore, we have a society that goes down the moral elevator. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1, Paul said, The Spirit speaks expressly, clearly, that in latter times men shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. And then he goes down the catalog of abomination. And here's what you got to remember. All of that stuff was legal. All of it's legal. When babies are killed, by the millions, it's legal in a nation that has legal, legalized genocide. Don't you understand that when Adam, when Adam's son, Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's children, when Cain took his brother's life, that when he had killed him and hidden his body or whatever he did, and when God said, where is your brother? Where is your brother? Cain said, am I supposed to keep up with my brother? Am I his keeper? Am I supposed to watch out for him all the time? And of course, we know he's lying, and he's lying to God who knows everything. And what God said to Cain should be important and profound to every man in this room. God says to Cain, your brother's blood, his blood has cried out. His blood has cried out. And many of us have missed the teaching. We've got the second teaching about the life being in the blood. But it's greater than that. When in 1951, when I was born down in John Gaston Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, to John and Pearl DeBerry, I was their blood. My dad is gone. My mama is gone. My grandmama is gone. My grandfather is gone. My great-grandmother is gone. My great-grandfather is gone. But their blood stands here in this pulpit. Their blood stands here speaking the truth from the word of God. When God said their blood, or his blood has cried out, what God is saying to Cain is you didn't just kill Abel. You killed Abel's sons and his son's sons and his son's son's sons. In other words, you killed the whole line of Abel. Everybody for generation after generation after generation that would have been born through Abel, you killed all of them. And all of those who will never be born are crying out to God. We'll never be born because of what Cain has done. Every time a child is snatched and Treat it like garbage. How many children would not be born because of this? Why? Because of perverted government. The devil wants to pervert government. If you go to the book of Revelation and studying there, he talks about the, the, he talks about the beast from the sea. The beast from the sea is perverted government. When government becomes perverted, when evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, when men who don't have godly conscience and godly intentions rule, the Bible says that the people suffer. Because of perverted government, abortion is legal. Because of perverted government, same-sex marriage is legal. Because of perverted government, we have all of these atrocities that are happening that are perfectly legal. You see, when you look at the economy of things, you have custom. I used to have an afro that was out there here. My daddy used to shake his head because I had the nerve to wear that thing to the pulpit. And my afro was out hanging on my shoulders, and he would just shake it. I, my children, I heard my children laughing one time. They had gone to the album, and, and they had a, a gospel meeting circular where I was preaching somewhere back in the early 70s, and they would talk about, look at his hair. What is wrong with his hair? And they were looking at my afro. But that's custom. Customs change. Men used to wear knickers, and we used to wear spats, and people had their customs change. Long 
change. We talked about the laws that had to do with, with slavery and women's rights and all types of things. Laws change. But what doesn't change are the principles. Principles don't change because principles are based on the nature of God. When we understand the nature of God, we understand what God wants the country uh, to be. I want you to think about something as we go through this and finish up this session this morning. Is your heart prepared for heaven? As you live as an American citizen, as an American man, as you think about your responsibility in this country as a citizen, when you think about your responsibility in helping to set the mores and the morals and the, and the standards and the integrity and the character and principle of this country, are we just going to become another evil nation? We've had nations recently that had atrocities where many of their people were killed. And it, it's a terrible thing, and I am not belittling it at all. But when we had 9-11 and we had others, while they were singing the national anthem of Italy or the national anthem of France because they are atheist nations, we sing, Nearer my God to thee. We sang America, uh, Amazing Grace because we are a Christian nation. We should not lose our identity as we try to merge into the mindset of the rest of the world. But we've got to maintain our character and our identity. What direction are you going? What is your course? Are you and God on the same plan in your life right now? And a lot of us have got to ask ourselves that question, are we on the same course with God? What should I do? Am I pointing in the wrong direction? Point this way? Point that way? Oh, there it is. God demands and expects obedience from all accountable people, both young and old. This is not monumental. This is a Christian's fundamental responsibility. Your fundamental responsibility in America is not to be a good Democrat, be a good Republican, be a good uh, um, uh, whatever you're, a member of the NAACP or a member of the Elks or the Moose or the Cats or the Dogs or whatever else we might be a member of. I'm not belittling those organizations, not at all. I know that, that we have Republicans and Democrats or whatever. I, I understand that. But everything I do is, first of all, guided, engaged, and determined by my faith. By my faith. I had some people ask me one time, considering some of the Democrat, Democratic policy, they said, how can you be a Christian and still be a Democrat? I said, because I'm a Christian. They said, no, how can you be a Christian and still be a Democrat? I said, because I'm a Christian. And they finally got it. I said, because I'm a Christian. I can be a Republican as a Christian. I can be a Democrat as a Rep Christian because what their policy don't determine my beliefs or my actions, my votes, or my life. My life is determined by what's written in the pages of inspiration. The Apostle Paul said in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and verses 12, Paul said the grace of God that bringeth salvation. The Republicans didn't bring salvation. The Democrats didn't bring salvation. The President didn't bring salvation. The Congress didn't bring salvation. The Senate, the Supreme Court didn't bring salvation. Christ brought salvation. And if we're going to bring salvation to these fools who are running the country, then I've got to first of all make a decision to be a Christian. Paul said, the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Doing what, Paul? Teaching us. What, Paul? Teaching us. What, Paul? Teaching us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust. What is ungodliness when any party, any group, any political power makes a law that opposes God's law? What can you do for your country? Be a Christian. Be a man. Be determinate. Be brave, be courageous, be uncompromising, be a good American. Because a good American understands what America is about. And it's not about the direction that many people right now are trying to lead us in. Paul says the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men teaching us. What did it teach us, Paul? That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, 
that we should live soberly, soberly. That's my responsibility to myself. Don't get drunk with pride. Don't get drunk with materialism. Don't get drunk with worldliness. Don't get drunk with the powers and prestige of this world. Don't get drunk with the big shots who think that they are somebody. Don't get drunk following any of them. Maintain your sobriety as a man of God and a Christian man. That's what you are supposed to do. The Apostle Paul understood that the politics of his day were going to take his life. He understood that the politicians of his day wanted him dead. He understood that the politician Jesus was killed by politicians in a political public execution. He understood that the same politicians and politics that had taken the life of Jesus, that had stoned poor Stephen for just standing there preaching the scheme of redemption, Paul understood that that same politics was going to take his life. He understood that. And for this reason, Paul said, what every man in this room better be able to say before you breathe your last breath and leave this world. Paul said, I have fought a good fight. Are you fighting a good fight? Are you sitting down on a seat of do nothing, leaning back on the elbows of do, let, do less, and say, wake me up when the fight's over? Are you one of those men who have straightened your backbone, opened your eyes, have clarity of vision, focus of mission, and understand that this country is good enough to fight for, to die for, because it ain't nothing else like it? Where are you going to go? when you leave America? To Kim jong Food? Where are you going? Where are we going? This country is worth fighting for. It's worth dying for. It's worth standing for. It's worth protecting. It's worth preserving. We say, well, Brother DeBerry, we, we haven't had a whole lot of good candidates. And, and this last, I've heard folks say, oh, I have gotten so tired, and I'm not, I, don't, I ain't talked to nobody about it, so I'm not talking about nobody. Don't go out of here lying on me. You know, for, oh, we had, I didn't have nobody to vote for. Oh, I just had to, oh, man. I had to hold my nose and do this. I had to hold my nose. I said, well, maybe a whole lot of folks had to. I said, what you had was Nebuchadnezzar and Jezebel. You had to kind of decide which one you were going to vote for. You know, God used Nebuchadnezzar, but he killed Jezebel. <laughs> so, you kind of you kind of had to decide and I'm not I'm not telling no I, I don't care because the bottom line is this the bottom line is this our job is for folks to know what we stand for he said sober my responsibility to myself Paul realized he was going to die because of the politics of his day he said I have fought a good fight I have finished my course I have kept the faith. Can you say that? Before you breathe your last breath, brethren, you better do that. You better do that for this country. You better fight a good fight because when you fight for the Lord's church, the Lord's church is supposed to lead. It is the light. The Lord said you are the light of the world. You are. You are the salt of the earth. What's the largest stadium? Uh, if you go to Neyland Stadium here in Tennessee, and you, cut, you do it at midnight when it's cloud covered, no light nowhere. You can't see your hand in front of you. You go to the 50-yard line of Neyland Stadium, that huge stadium, and you strike one match. It doesn't matter where you're in that big stadium that seats over 100,000 people. You can see that one match. That one match. You can see the light of that one match because light destroys darkness. The devil wants to tell you you're outnumbered, outgunned, outmanned, outfinanced, and ain't nothing you can do. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. They told folks that nobody want to watch the Bible. They made a series on the Bible, and all of a sudden it was the most watched series in history. Remember that a couple of years ago? It's a lie. Anytime they tell us we don't have influence, that nobody's listening to you, that you're on the wrong side of history, that you need to just close the church down and go on home and get with the program, it's a lie. It's a lie. The devil's scared to death of you. You're the last men standing. You're the Lord's church. 
Everybody else have already compromised, capitulated, given, given up, and walked in the moonwalk backwards. You're the last men standing. And the Lord said, if you stand, the deal has always been. If you stand, I'll stand with you. That's always been the deal. If you fight, I'll fight with you. If you speak, I'll stand behind you. That's always been the deal. Paul said soberly, righteously, our responsibility to our brethren. We have a responsibility to one another. Understand something. You're two people. You're the spiritual man, and you're the carnal man or the fleshly man. The one you feed will live. The one you starve will die. If you continue to feed the carnal man with all he does is politics and money and prestige and job and popularity and, and moving up the ladder and getting strong and getting rich and a bigger house and a better car, if you concentrate on that, your spiritual man's going to die. Your spiritual man getting weaker and weaker while you're giving all your power and authority to the fleshly man. And I'm not saying don't strive to have good stuff. The Lord said, if you seek first the kingdom, I give you some stuff. You can have, I don't need the stuff. I give you the stuff. But what the Lord is saying is, here's how you get the stuff. You seek first the kingdom. You stand up for me. When my folks stand up for me, David said, I have been young. I am now old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed beg. God said, so you think I'm going to let these people beat you down because you stand for me? You think I'm going to let them take your stuff because you stand for me? You think I'm going to let them hurt your family because you stand for me? Lord says, no. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. You stand and you stand in faith. Paul knew that the minute his head dropped in that basket that he was going to see the Lord. But he had finished his course. Soberly, righteously, godly. You serve the Lord with all that you've got. And the Lord will be with you all the way to the end. Let me leave you with a news flash here. God wants first place in your life. He wants first place. When you go in that voting box, he wants first place. When you stand in your politics, he wants first place. When you think about which way you want this nation to go, he wants first place. When you look to the future where your children and grandchildren and how they're going to live, he wants first place. He wants first place in your life. And that is the only place that he's going to accept. So, listen, to, finally, what is your life? It's up to you. You're a self-made man. Every one of us in this room are self-made men. And we're going to do what we ought to do in our country when we realize who we are. What's your life in the past? Look in the past. Ask yourself, have I been standing the way the Lord wants me to stand? Have I compromised? Did I keep my mouth closed when I should have said something? Did I sit down when I should have stood? Did I keep silent when I should have preached? Did I turn my head when I should have looked somebody dead in the eye and told them they were wrong. What's your life in the past? Look retrospectively. What's your life in the present? Introspective. Look within yourself. Do you have the guts, the gall, and the wherewithal to be what God needs you to be to save this country? Do you? Do you have it? All of us got to ask ourselves, do I have it in me what I need to save this country? And there's not another one like it. Where are you today? What's your future prospectively? Where are you going? Where are your children going to be? Are your children going to be in the church when you're gone? Are they going to lead when you're too old to lead? Are you gone? Where is your future heading? Where are you prospectively? For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. My brothers and my sisters, or my brothers, the sisters ain't in here, but my brothers, the devil's scared to death of y'all. He's scared to death of you. Because when he looks, not just in this church, but in churches all over this country, the lies exposed. Nobody's standing. Nobody's speaking. Nobody's fighting. Nobody cares. Nobody's raising their children. Nobody's worshiping. Nobody's leading. Y'all make the devil out for what the Lord said he is, a liar. And don't you stop doing it.